Zoom recording. So we are now recording. Huzzah, huzzah. And this is what our agenda is going to look like today. We have a lot to get through for the next hour and a half or so. Um, we're going to be hearing from two key presenters, Leonard and Yvette. Uh, and then we're going to move on to an advocacy discussion with Shakira and Natasha. And we're going to uh, close out with some important remarks from Chris and Erica. Um, so uh, really looking forward to this agenda. I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask my uh, amazing co-host, uh, partner in crime, someone uh, we were just reminiscing. We met at the Cape Town Microbicides Conference in 2006 when we were like, I think I was maybe 10 and Manju I think was about 15. I know Manju is a lot older than me. Um, but wow, has time flied and flown and she has been such a wonderful partner and comrade. And I'm so delighted she is helping me to host this meeting today. And she's going to be making some um, opening remarks now. Over to you, Manju. Jim, I think that your old age is really getting to you. <laughs> I was five. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Really, really happy to see so many of you joining us today for, as Jim described, a great conversation uh, with friends and comrades. And, um, and, and I really hope that we are here to, to listen and also plan uh, and, and strategize together. You have no doubt um, heard about, read about, seen a discussion about the vaginal ring over the last couple of years and a lot this year. If you were at Montreal or followed it from afar, you definitely wouldn't have missed the energy and excitement, uh, really uh, calling for choice calling for access to choice uh, in the research that's done, but importantly, in what is available for all of us to pick from, to pick tools that work in our life at, those, at, the, at the time we need it. Um, while you may have heard, there are a number of countries that are either conducting implementation research or getting ready for it. There seems to be a looming question about long-term access to the ring. And so there's been a lot of advocacy about that. Um, and today we're going to hear some of it. Um, and, and like I said earlier, while we're going to really focus in on the Depiverine ring today, this is about a, a, a larger, con larger conversation about choice, about what does it mean to truly put our, our money where our mouth is when we say choice is important and that different people need different things at different times of their lives. And what does it really take to do that? Um, and I'm, I'm really excited. I want to steal the thunder from any of the advocates who are really going to be talking about this at the global stage, what they've been doing, but also in their own countries, in Uganda, in Zambia, and in the US. So. With further, you know, without further ado, I am going to call on uh, my friend and comrade, uh, Leonard Soleil, who is the VP, um, VP at IPM. He's the VP for Product Access and External Affairs at IPM South Africa. And he's going to talk to us uh, for a few minutes uh, about, he'll revisit the ring results, so we're all on the same page. He'll talk about where we are right now with regulatory submissions of the Depiverine ring. He'll give us an overview of ring rollout, where it's being uh, getting ready for rollout, uh, where we're still waiting to hear. And then he'll also tell us excitingly about research into future rings. Um, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions before we move to the next speaker. So Leonard Soleil, We'd love to see you before you start your slides. Can you see me? I'm on video. There you are. Hi. Hello, Take Manji. it away, Leonard. Hi, Leonard. Thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you Jim. Hi, everybody. And uh, thank you, Jim and Manju, for um, 
hosting this session and thank you for all the support on behalf of IPM that we've received for the ring over the many, many, many years. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen and hear me well. So it's been an exciting and interesting time for the um, Depivirin vaginal ring. And also as all of you on this call would know, not without challenges, challenges that we have taken in our stride over the many, many years. So over the next 20 minutes, I'll give an overview of critical activities that take the ring from um, research to product access. I'll touch on research and looking at the questions that we had when Jim sent out the invitation. Um, it would be important to touch on a few aspects. I'll speak about regulatory pathways for the ring and well, some of the regulatory approvals that we've received, rollout plans, and then also briefly talk about the ring pipeline, which I think is also exciting. So um, before I dive into everything ring, um, most of you know that IPM's products have been acquired by the Population Council, something we're really excited about. And the reasons, and I'm sure that we are all contending with these two, um, especially all of us nonprofits in this call, it's, it's financial and it's having adequate funding to do the work that we need to do. So um, at IPM, ensuring sufficient funds for the huge undertaking um, of manufacturing and in introducing a new product has been challenging. And our timing of this was slap bang in the middle of COVID, um, already overwhelming and already full slate of demands and global health priorities. So it was critical to, to look at funding and management efficiencies. And I think um, this acquisition by the Population Council will benefit the ring's uh, long-term sustainability and help ensure that the ring has its place in uh, the HIV prevention portfolio for women. Um, from an alignment perspective, this um, arrangement consolidates decades of product um, innovation expertise between IPM and the Population Council. And as you know, the Population Council um, also works on vaginal rings with their focus on contraception and HIV. Um, and we're hoping that the streamlined product development and delivery uh, pathway um, over time will benefit the Pivrine ring and all its extension products as well. So a number of questions have been asked. I'm hoping to answer many of those in this presentation, but I have colleagues, um, uh, Diantha Pele, uh, Sinazo Patra, and Anita Garg on this call from IPM, and um, I've asked them also, they have the questions that have been sent, and they will be um, answering the question in the chat, so please feel free to post in there as well. So, um, uh, okay, the first slide. Going, looking back at the Depurberine ring, everyone knows the ring, a flex, flexible silicone vaginal ring developed by IPM. And let me mention that we have demonstration ring kits. Um, if you want demonstration rings, please reach out to us for your programs and we'll be happy to send to you as well. Um, the ring is woman initiated and the first long acting HIV prevention product. Um, IPM received the molecule Depivirine ring through exclusive worldwide rights through Janssen Sciences, a Johnson & Johnson company. And looking back at our clinical trial results, you'll remember the two big phase three trials that took place, the ring study and Aspire. We lived through these trials over a number of years. Both trials showed efficacy, the mod modest efficacy, 35% in the ring study and 27% in Aspire. When our open label program took place, um, we saw better adherence to product and greater risk reduction, uh, well over 50%. And looking back at our PrEP studies, very similar to what people saw in the IPREX studies and in the IPREX Olay in the early days as well. Um, very excitingly, in July 2020, we received a positive scientific opinion from the EMA. We had submitted under a procedure called Medicines for All. And shortly after that, um, WHO gave a recommendation and then followed it up with guidelines for the ring in 2021, together with the PQ as well. So under one of WHO's procedures called a collaborative registrations procedure, uh, we submitted to many African regulatory um, authorities, and this is a fast track procedure, once again, right in the middle of COVID. 
So the procedures were meant to take a lot, about three months uh, before we got approvals. However, it did take a bit longer than that um, because of the sheer burden at the NMRAs. So we're excited you know, to receive um, approvals from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, from Uganda, Zambia, and Kenya as well. We've had, we have approvals from six countries. We're still waiting for a few other countries, um, imminent, and our next phase of um, regulatory submissions will be to Mozambique, Ethiopia, um, and Nigeria. And uh, to mention submissions are quite a, a labor intensive process. Um, it's submission of the full dossier, um, which is like 260,000 pages of information. Um, fortunately, with all the assessment reports from the WHO and from the EMA, it helps speed up uh, the review process. Um, but the reviews are still as stringent. So there were questions around regulatory reviews and processes and, um, and the discussion around the FDA, which will come up shortly, um, just to mention that the EMA is as stringent as ever, even though the product was not a, is not specifically approved for women in Europe, but the procedure that they follow is as stringent. Um, moving on to the next slide, before I talk about um, uh, ring access and where the planning is, I want to give a quick overview of Mosaic. Um, and I know there are many Mosaic colleagues on this call, and, they, and including Manju, who belongs, is part of Mosaic as well, who can do a much better job at this. Um, but um, Mosaic is a five-year USAID-funded project um, being led by FHI 360 with some US uh, partners and also with African partners uh, um, assisting with country activities as well. And some of the key aspects of uh, Mosaic uh, focuses on introduction and access for new uh, biomedical prevention uh, tools. And at the moment, the focus is on the ring and on cab LA. Uh, Mosaic work, works across multiple countries to support um, user-centered product introduction, research, uh, research utilization and capacity strengthening as well. Um, supports a multi-product market uh, with informed choice for HIV prevention as new products enter the market. And we're hoping over the next few years, while uh, Mosaic is still being um, 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 undertaken across countries and new products will become available. Um, Mosaic uh, in-country partners also collaborate very closely with ministries of health, uh, USAID missions, um, implementing partners as well, civil society organizations, uh, end user studies, looking at end user research, uh, demand creation materials, um, working with providers, other local and global stakeholders, and um, of course, working with us uh, and supporting us product developers as well. So that's a very quick um, snapshot of Mosaic. And if you want to know more details about Mosaic, um, all the information is loaded onto PrepWatch. And I saw Jim uh, give the links to PrepWatch as well. Um, so lots of the information also on the ring uh, um, is available on um, the PrepWatch website or reaching out to the um, Mosaic colleagues as well. So um, some uh, briefly, I'll, I'll look at some um, country highlights. Um, countries where regulatory approvals have been received, and in some countries where regulatory submissions are yet to um, take place, in, and also in some countries where um, um, approval is still pending as well, but they're preparing for a ring introduction. Um, and before I speak about some of the activities, just to mention, uh, that um, most countries, uh, before doing a big uh, full-on scale-up of ring introduction, would like to conduct implementation studies and pilot programs and get information from these programs that would inform their broader scale rollout. And this is very much in line with what was done for um, oral prep as well. It would help them optimally integrate the ring into their current um, HIV prevention programs. So um, just looking at some of the highlights, um, Uganda, it's exciting to note that um, the National Prevention Committee has endorsed the um, adoption of the ring. Um, and I've mentioned Catalyst in a few of these bullets. So Catalyst is um, an implementation um, study uh, studies being um, 
conducted under IRB, which would take place in five countries. And this also is part of the um, Mosaic program as well. So Kenya, the ring is uh, being included in Kenya's um, HIV prevention guidelines. A catalyst study is going to start there. In Eswatini, uh, a pilot study is imminent in Eswatini as well, a smaller pilot study. And we heard the other day that the MSF, Medicine Sans Frontier, uh, will also be including the ring in some of their programs. And I believe that last week, um, some ring actually landed in Eswatini, which is really exciting. Uh, from Lesotho, uh, the ring is included in the um, ring uh, in Lesotho's HIV guidelines, and Lesotho was actually the first country to include the Perverine ring in the essential medicines list, which means that the ring can be rolled out in Lesotho's public sector clinics. Catalysts will also take place in Lesotho. South Africa was, um, SAPRA approved the ring in, in March this year, and the Department of Health set up a long-acting technical working group uh, planning for ring implementation. Um, many of us participate in that technical working group, looking at how um, ring will be introduced into pilot programs, but also uh, through Catalyst as well. Similarly, in Zimbabwe, also to mention that in Zimbabwe, PSI or PSH was the first to um, start with the ring program in Africa. They received a ring, their rings a, a few months ago, and um, they have included ring in the oral prep program. Similarly, similarly, in Namibia, they do not have regulatory approval, planning for smaller studies. Um, Nigeria, very much um, also showing interest as well. Zambia would like to see um, data from some of the neighboring countries before they move forward with um, any ring implementation activities. So it's starting slow, however, it's, um, it's moving in a positive direction. Um, you will know that the ring's not approved for women under the age of 18 or for pregnant or breastfeeding women. And um, the MTN, Microbicide, Trial, Microbicide Trials Network, has led three important studies looking at ring use in adolescent girls and young women, uh, pregnant women and breastfeeding women as well. The REACH study, uh, the DELIVER study and the BE PROTECTED study. I'm not going to go through this in detail in the interest of time, um, but just to mention some highlights. So the REACH study, which um, included women 16 and 17 years old, um, presented some findings recently and was really interesting. Um, the REACH study is a crossover study um, young women used the ring or oral prep for six months, and after six months, they switched over. The oral prep group took the ring, and the ring group went on to oral prep for a further six months. At the end of the year, of a year, they were asked to choose what they would like to use. So it was interesting that 67% of participants chose to use the ring, and 31% chose oral prep. Uh, in terms of safety, there were no safety concerns noted as we know from our clinical trials as well, that the ring is, is um, has an excellent safety profile. Um, acceptability for both products high, 88% um, for the ring and 64% for oral prep. And adherence was great. It's something that we've not seen in clinical trials as well. It's also that when young women know that a product works, they use the product better. Uh, the two um, support, the two uh, other studies deliver uh, where pregnant women have been participating, is proceeding well with no safety concerns in two cohorts that have completed thus far. Cohort three is underway. And um, data from the uh, Be Protected study, the breastfeeding study, um, showed um, very little con amount of depurberine in breast milk with once again um, an excellent uh, uh, safety profile making the ring possibly a good choice for pregnant and breastfeeding women as these studies complete and be able to um, share peer-reviewed data. Um, so that's really encouraging as well. Um, Manjo, Jim, I know you mentioned that um, you will ping me if I'm going over time. So um, quickly, I wanted to share, and this is gonna be an important part of the conversation, I wanted to share some findings from a recent consultation conducted by the WHO's Global Programs on HIV, uh, Hepatitis, and STIs. And um, for context, IPM withdrew the Dupuvirine ring application to the FDA. And many of you have been following this discussion. So I'm just going to revisit it 
briefly. So as we approached the final FDA decision date, and this was two years ago, we received feedback from the FDA indicating that the current data in the ring would not be sufficient to support FDA approval. So IPM took a decision to stop the review procedure. We were told that the um, HIV-1 risk reduction observed in the two clinical trials, the ring study and the SPIRE study, is substantially below the current standard of care option available in the US. And that their assessment at the time was based on the product's benefits profile within the current HIV prevention landscape for women in the United States. And this was, of course, indeed disappointing. So following our um, withdrawal from the FDA, um, the WHO, um, Michelle Rodolf and colleagues were requested by PEPFAR to conduct um, interviews with African ministries of health, civil society, donors, implementing partners, to understand um, their perspectives and then make recommendations to PEPFAR um, and also to others. So prior to these uh, results being released, and many of you were pre present at that webinar, at the um, webinar discussion as well, uh, PEPFAR Pep advised that they would not support procurement of RING for wider scale um, public health programming. However, they would continue to support RING um, purchases for um, uh, the implementation studies. Um, so, yeah. So uh, the dissemination of these findings uh, took place in May, um, and there was a huge outcry from civil society and from many stakeholder groups. I've listed some of the key themes here in the slide. Um, and importantly, um, some of the uh, um, responses from the ministries of health was that uh, ministries look at their own um, regulatory authorities uh, before making decisions rather than the FDA when it comes to making their decisions. They had already um, feedback from a stringent authority like the EMA, um, so that was adequate. And then, of course, the uh, WHO recommendation, which was really important as well. Um, ministries were concerned about the funding aspect, of course, which meant they would need to look for funding from donors outside of PEPFAR. Um, the message, which came through really strongly, that the message for HIV prevention in women has always been about giving choice and options. And uh, these came across strongly from all stakeholders that uh, were interviewed and that there was a need to continue supporting choice and options if we have uh, a hope in hell of um, stemming infection rates, especially in adolescent girls and young women as well. Um, also messaging around the ring versus more systemic products um, would be critical. Um, of course, the ring has a modest efficacy compared to more systemic products. So uh, that would be extremely important, you know, when discussing the ring. Um, and then clearly there was an ethical consideration about women who participated in trials and now would be denied access to a product that was shown to be efficacious. And Yvette is an expert on this, and she will talk much more about this later and all about her advocacy engagements that she's been spearheading as well. Um, so the next slide, I'll talk about a little bit about the supply chain. This is what the between ring ring um, or DAPI ring packaging looks like. Uh, for one ring, the ring is pack packaged either in one ring in foil per box or in a three ring packaging. And um, at the moment we have a one ring packaging. So in terms of procurement, I mentioned the first ring shipment went to um, Zimbabwe, 14,500 rings, an exciting moment for us. There is a DDR dedicated website called uh, prepring.org, um, which of course gives all the, the um, safety and PV support uh, to countries. Uh, currently, Zimbabwe has access to that site, and uh, countries, once they start receiving the ring, will also get access to that site, where there's a whole host of forms for reporting on various um, aspects as well. Ring is now eligible for procurement at the Global Fund, and there's a link here. It was included on the list in uh, March 2022, um, and the team is also working on the Global Fund to um, set to look at um, all the procurement details as well. I mentioned MSF earlier as well, which is really exciting. Um, there's been additional interest from many um, African countries for importing Ring. Um, 
and recently IPM has um, also, um, well, we're on the verge of um, signing on a global distributor, which will, which will help um, in giving product to countries. Um, very briefly on the product pipeline, we urgently, we excitingly anticipate the um, three month thing, and I think it's important to look at our line extensions as big, because there's been a lot of interest in the three month thing for many reasons. Uh, the three month ring looks almost like it, well, it's identical to the, the one month ring in terms of size. It contains 100 milligrams of the purine ring. However, it's self inserted not once a month, but every three months. Same dimensions, formulation, and manufacturing as a decurin. Um, sustained release over three months. And once again, no cold chain or special storage needed. Importantly, the three month thing will drop the price by 66%. Um, so that is a huge advantage as well um, for the public sector. Um, at the moment, a bioavailability study or a crossover study is, is underway. And um, the data from the study will be really important um, when submitting a dossier for the three month ring as a line extension to IPM's uh, one month ring. So um, the study essentially is looking at the bioavailability of um, the purverine in the vag vagina, comparing the two rings as well. Um, another product, which is a little further out than the, um, than the um, three month ring is IPM's Depurverine contraceptive vaginal ring. Um, this is a three month ring as well with 200 milligrams of Depurverine and levonorgestrel. So it's HIV prevention and contraception as well. Um, and I want to touch very briefly on community engagement. And this slide shows some of the logos of the many partners that we've worked with. So IPM has had a robust and um, very exciting uh, community engagement and advocacy program that has supported ring research over many years. And not to leave communities behind, uh, this program has continued. Um, while we look at implementation, we've worked really closely with partners like AVAC, who supported us over the many years uh, doing, this, doing this work, and of course, all our in-country partners as well. So it's been a really important part of um, the access work as, um, as we move forward, and we're hoping with funding that this work can be expanded and continue as well. Um, a shout out to our online program, you, you know, during COVID was really difficult to do face to face activities. Um, IPM has a digital platform inside my purse, uh, which is a blog site and a Facebook page. This is led by Simazo Pato, and this has grown exponentially over the years. It's really great. Um, we've had online Women's Day conferences where we've had up to 7,000 women join the platform, and Simazo can share a lot more at the moment. While Sanazo manages a platform, the platform is actually the platforms, should I say, are hosted and led by inside my purse ambassadors, young women who lead the dialogue and all the online engagements. So it's really exciting. So please go and have a look. Um, and this is to acknowledge our donors. And thank you. Thank you so much, Leonard. As always, a really uh, packed presentation with so much information. Um, and I, I recognize that there will be a lot of questions, um, but maybe we can take two burning questions now, uh, ask others to put any questions in the chat for uh, Leonard to get to, so we can get to our next presenter and then take more questions. So this is the opportunity. We would love for somebody to raise their hand and ask a burning question. We would love to hear the voice of one of the participants on the call. Anybody want to ask uh, Leonard a question directly? Don't be shy. Leonard won't bite. Much. Hi, Leonard. This I think Shakira. Shakira. Go ahead, Shakira. Hi, Shakira. Yes. Hi. My question is, when are we 
going to be able to move away from using the 20, uh, from using the 30% as the percentage and using the, the percentage that came out of the open label extension studies. Shakira, so the, um, we will continue to use, to talk about the, um, the efficacy of the ring that has been submitted to the regulators in your country. And I think it's important to, to use that messaging. Um, however, you can use the um, Olay studies as well when, you, when you're conducting your efficacy work, you know, with your advocacy work. But I think it's important to note the um, efficacy that the regulators in country, what they have approved. Thanks, Leonard. And it's really an important question, Shakira, because there are so many numbers. And as advocates, we want to give the absolute right information, but we also want to reflect the, the growing uh, knowledge that new research does. Um, so I, I think an important question that we as advocates um, have to deal with sometimes. Peter, I see you have your hand up, 2022 fellow Peter in Lesotho. Uh, thank you very much, Manju and Leonard for the wonderful presentation. I, I, I would like to, to hear, uh, maybe I missed the, the, the part about the, on the three month ring, the, the efficacy of the ring, and which uh, also I think uh, raises my second question as to whether the uh, the movement towards uh, uh, developing the three months ring was also informed by the the pricing factor that had seemed to be the problem because uh, one of the the advantages you had mentioned is that it's going to reduce the yearly cost of the ring by sixty six percent. Or, uh, well, I, I would want to know the, the efficacy of the, if the efficacy stays the same, but what uh, increases is the dose of the, the pivotal in the, uh, yes, I think that's uh, my question. I don't know if I was clear enough. Uh, Leonard, did you hear the question? Leonard? Le Leonard, we can't hear you. You're muted, Leonard. Still muted, Leonard. Still muted, Leonard. <laughs> but what about Audible? Uh... Yes, Peter, you are audible, but we are having a hard time hearing Leonard. Okay, thank you. No, Leonard. Leonard can't hear you. So he says he's stuck on on his removing the I think removing the the, the mute. He can't. Anita, I see that you have come off mute. Are you able to answer the question? Anita from Anita Garg from IPM. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thanks, Anita. Okay, great. Um, no, Leonard, we still can't hear you, unfortunately. But I, I think Go I ahead. caught most of the question. Okay, I think I caught most of the question and it was about the three month frame. Um, so certainly, uh, the price was mentioned, that's a big consideration for us. So um, the three month ring will essentially um, cut the cost of the ring, you know, very, very dramatically as uh, it, it's not going to cost much more per ring than the monthly depivering ring and you'll only need to have uh, four rings a year. So that's a big consideration for us. Um, I think the other question was about the efficacy of that product. And what we're doing now is conducting a study um, to show that that product is, uh, produces bioequivalent reactions to the monthly ring, essentially that it's delivering the same or more um, depivirine to the woman as the monthly ring. So 
we're not reconducting an efficacy study, so we won't have new efficacy rates or data to show from that study, but rather we're trying to demonstrate that that product is equivalent or better um, in terms of the amount of depivirine that it delivers to the body. Was there another part of the question that I missed? No, I think that is all. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, Manju? Very welcome. Yes, can hear you now. Um, okay. Glad you're back. Um, were you going to say something? Uh, Leonard, Anita, thank you so much for answering the question. Were you going to add anything, Leonard, before I moved on? No, thank you. Sorry, I had load shading, so my power went out and I switched on to a, to a battery. Um, we are having huge challenges here. As totally understand, and we, we, we really... Um, have a lot of empathy for all of you in South Africa who are having to deal with load shedding. So Sadie, I see you have your hand up, but can I request you humbly to put your question in the chat so we can um, move on? And Leonard, please, if you will answer any questions that come up in the chat. I just wanna thank uh, Leonard so much and Anita um, and Diantha for answering another question. The IPM team uh, is always ready to answer questions and we're very grateful. So with that, I am actually going to hand over to Jim to take us uh, forward. Thank you so much, Manju. And yes, thank you to Leonard and Yvette, whom I'm about to introduce, and everyone else from South Africa who is joining us today um, during these sort of very challenging circumstances with load shedding, what have you. So we really appreciate your efforts. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce Yvette Raphael. She is the executive director of advocacy for HIV prevent for HIV prevention or advocacy for the prevention of HIV and AIDS. Uh, it's based in South Africa. We'll put a drop some links in the chat for you. Um, she, you know, we we led up this uh, this uh, webinar with the the song Superwoman. Um, she's certainly a, a superwoman and a superhuman, uh, an amazing comrade. And I will have to say, I'm really glad. She's on my side, that we're on the same side. I would not want to be um, on, on the other side uh, of Yvette Raphael. <laughs> so Yvette, without further ado, please tell us what's been going on with uh, ring advocacy in Africa. And Yvette, you need to come off mute, my friends. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Jim, for the, for the kind introduction. First of all, I would like to acknowledge every single woman who has been part of the advocacy for, for the ring over the past 12 years. And I, 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 I come alone, but many of my comrades are on the line. Many of my comrades are in their communities doing advocacy. So I'd really like to acknowledge them in case I forget to mention the many women who have hope for a ring in Africa. So why the ring? I think um, most importantly is that we must acknowledge that one of the reasons why women in Africa, women in uh, uh, globally would be excited about anything ring is because itself it's self inserted monthly it's discreet it does not interfere with sex it's ex it's excellent safety profile which means um, women can use it and feel safe around it and it's also the very first long acting hiv prevention product and women have been advocating for a hiv self uh, a woman initiated discreet hiv preventions for many many years and I just want to, uh, Jim, you asked me to do slides and I'm allergic to slides, but I do have some uh, talking points in front of me, which I will share with everyone. So uh, just a little bit brief background around why we are where we are right now with the advocacy around HIV prevention. And I just want to also acknowledge the uh, community global advisory group that what participate in any of the trials and studies. And uh, in 2015, we established the very first community advisory group to provide 
a forum for civil society advocates and other stakeholders to engage and li liaise with study teams, specifically at the time it was with ECHO, to around the study conduct, the review participants and communication materials, and also uh, participate in some of the broader issues related to, to studies. Um, so our involvement as women and the, the global advisory uh, board or accountability board goes around the protocol development, recruitment, the retention, and also the study completion and the resu result dissemination. So for a long time, if women advocates, because we are part of studies, we, we, we participate in studies, we are the trial participants, we are the women who actually make women in our community participate in, uh, in studies. So the result dissemination is a very big role of, uh, of the work that we do. And for years have we been promising women around our communities in Africa and South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, around the possibility of this specific uh, tool. And you can imagine when we had to go back and say, uh, when we have to go back and say to these women, there will be no ring. So the African Community uh, Prevention Accountability Board was formed very early this year. Initially, the work was around the long acting Kabale, but we thought uh, what better way for us to focus our strengths, focus our energies and all of the studies and the rings uh, study was one of them and it's for uh, women from the African region and globally and it is like I said the continuation from the ground from the groundbreaking work that we did during ECHO. Our advocacy to date uh, I will just mention that we formalized the African Women's Community Prevention Advisory Board and I would say women in Africa gave themselves a very very important name there is 29 ad, uh, ad, uh, members representing six countries, Kenya, South Africa, Malawi, Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and the Republic of Tanzania, as Dr. Lillian would say. And we also have comrades supporting in the US, Dazon Diallo and Danielle specifically around this work. So to date, we also had meetings with UNAIDS. One of the meetings, uh, one of the, uh, Good things that came out of the meeting is that the executive director committed to uh, be to to be the champion uh, around the ring and advocacy at, and advocate at all policy platforms where she will be at. The executive director committed to engage with PEPA and Global Fund advocating for funding around the ring. And during her engagement at AIDS 2020, uh, 2022 in Montreal, did we see how the ED of um, UNAIDS really, really took on this role and advocated for women. We also to date had meetings with USAID. We, one particular meeting was our meeting with uh, Ambassador John Nkenkasong in Montreal, and the meeting provided us an opportunity for, for us to present to the ambassador why PEPA investment into prevention into the prevention agenda and female control preventative tools uh, is important and uh, highlighting our complementary for the DREAMS program, which means we, 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 we mentioned how the DREAMS program was a build up to some of the advocacy that he sees around the ring. He committed that he would then go back to PEPFA, have a discussion and also um, subsequently, the scientific advisory board was held on the 8th of September, and indeed, one of the uh, agenda items was discussed uh, was the Depovering Ring and advocates, myself and Chilufi Hapongo, made public comments, and that was a big win for our advocacy. What we are currently busy with is we are busy with the development of the Choice Manifesto, which will also, as Manju mentioned earlier, which will also give uh, an understanding that what we are fighting for or what we are advocating for is not only specifically for the ring, but also for choice for women and also for the future of choice and advocacy around a ring that would become available. Um, what we're looking for in uh, forward to is the launch of the Choice Manifesto and the kickoff of the community actions in October. Um, 
So our our advocacy is clear that until there's a ring, it means the, no three-month ring, no multipurpose technology. And as advocates, we are saying no rings, no studies in Africa. Uh, I would like to also um, mention some of the organizations that supported the advocacy uh, throughout the uh, for the ring, as well as for choice for women. High up on our uh, on our list comes AVEP, obviously, and APA, ICW, Mton Jenny, AEDC, and many many other organizations that have supported our work. The 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 dream for a ring for women in Africa is something that we've been waiting for for a very long time. And I hope um, policymakers, funders would understand that the ring is not only a, a decision around what uh, I, I hear a lot around efficacy. It's not just around efficacy. Efficacy will go up once the ring becomes available and women start using it. But we must remember that women, if women use the ring, obviously the effect of the ring will be much higher. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, Yvette. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, you're amazing. And, and thank you for all your uh, great work and all the great work I know you're going to do. We're going to make sure people get this ring. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to move it on to our advocacy discussion that uh, Manju is going to lead. And then I think we'll take some questions for all of our advocates, both including Yvette um, and Natasha and Shakira. So I'm going to turn it over to Manju for the next section of our webinar. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jim. And, and more, uh, Yvette, thank you for your leadership. You have been steadfast uh, along with many others in really keeping this on the radar, ensuring that people are hearing our voices as advocates for choice and for the ring. Um, and I, I, I really just want to uh, acknowledge the role that you've played in, in this alongside so many other um, leaders in this space. So like Jim said, we're going to hear from our other two advocacy um, speakers, just a few minutes from them each, and then we can have a few questions on kind of the, the, the scope of advocacy right now. And so we heard uh, Yvette really talk about this on a on a global and regional space as much as she talked about what's happening at country level but now we're going to hear from two young women who are leading efforts in their countries and working with other young women to to talk about advocacy um, and to get them involved in any efforts to talk to policymakers and move move the discussion further so I see that Natasha is off, uh, she's on video and all ready to go. So we are going to start with Natasha Muila. Natasha is a 2022 AVAC Advocacy Fellow. She is being hosted by the Network of Zambian People Living with HIV NZP Plus uh, in Zambia. And uh, Take it away, Natasha. In a few minutes, please tell us about your advocacy in Zambia. Hey, thank you so much, mind you. I hope I'm audible enough. So I turned on my video just for a few moments, just for a few minutes. So again, thank you so much for the warm welcome and good day to everyone that's on this platform. Thank you for joining in. So I would just switch off the video because the internet is quite unstable and you may lose me along the way. Just um, so I'll get right into it. Okay, so um, I will be, just as what Manju uh, spoke to, I will be sharing with you experiences and some works that I am doing around advocacy, advocating for uh, DVR among adolescent girls and young women in Zambia. So the reason or really the passion to advocate for uh, HIV uh, prevention method uh, that is woman initiated and gives a woman the power um, to make a decision autonomously, you know, stems from a personal cause. And I say personal because it is, I am a young woman myself living in Zambia and I have experienced and can relate to 
the many challenges and injustices that puts women in vulnerable situations, thus making us highly susceptible to HIV infections. So Zambia is a country where uh, it embraces a patriarch system. And because of that, our culture, our societal norms, the religion, economic constructs and injustices put women in a position where we weren't able to have, you know, the power to make decisions. Could be in our homes, places of work, and mostly sexual relationships. So some of the stories that I've had to listen to uh, during my works of advocacy from women, I'll quote a few, and some of them, some of the women would say, you know, only the man should provide a condom to use during sex and only when he wishes to, which is rarely the case because they prefer not to use condoms. Also, another woman would say, I cannot use oral prep even when I am aware that my male partner is having multiple partners because when he finds the pill, the oral pills, he will accuse me of being unfaithful. Another would say, I have to have unprotected sex when my male partner uh, says, we need to because if I don't, he will no longer financially support me. Another woman said, my family encourages me not to use condoms uh, as a married woman because it is disrespectful to my husband despite him having multiple sexual partners outside our marriage. So now all of these stories that I've quoted, um, these are young women's reality and these stories really make me sad. They make my heart bleed in that not only do we lack control and autonomy, we also lack an HIV prevention method or two that has been made available, but is not yet approved in Zambia, for example. And the Ministry of Health Zambia, just I think Lena touched best on this. Recently, they shared a succulent where they stated that as government, they wish not to approve the Department Vaginal Ring right now in Zambia, and they wish to learn from the results of the ongoing uh, studies happening in Kenya, South Africa, and Zimbabwe, and therefore they will not add it to the HIV prevention guidelines. It is a tough road, it is very uh, challenging. However, the government is open to discussions and as CSOs, we requested for the government's audience and we are waiting for a follow-up meeting that uh, we will be able to talk more about the questions and lessons that they hope to learn or wish to learn from other countries to make a decision on behalf of the Zambian women that are having this burden that have to deal with a high burden of HIV infections. So now what am I doing as an advocate? So I have been um, having meetings, I have been having trainings and recently during the HIV testing and treatment day, uh, I mobilized a number of adolescent girls and young women and we marched and I have also engaged the media as well as allies, uh, CSOs to raise awareness and share information on DVR and what it would mean to Zambian women if uh, DVR was made available. So now despite the government's position around DVR, engaging with the community has really, really been hopeful this far because most women are looking forward to having this too as an added option. And despite of you know the concerns where MOH Zambia would say, well, uh, we're concerned about the 50% efficacy rate. Well, we are saying 50% is better than nothing at all. And DVR should be made available because we need more choices. It is not only to empower women, but also to facilitate the reduction in the high HIV infections that have been recently uh, recorded. Because with, I think the 2021 stats were showing that 42% of uh, new infections were attributed to adolescents and young people. And from the over a number, which is I think was about 14,000 um, adolescents and young people, 11,000 were women, women, 11,000 were women. So that is very, very concerning. And with, you know, all these challenges that we are facing in Zambia in terms of, you know, the government being very skeptical or rather having to raise concerns about the efficacy rate. I think the language in my advocacy that is really, really coming out is, you know, we need more choice. It's choice, choice, and choice, and HIV combination prevention because no one size fits all. And just like Yvette said, there's need to make available um, more options for women because we're the ones that are highly burdened and most vulnerable. So um, to wrap this up, these are some of the works that I've been doing. And again, yes, Jim, choice, choice, and choice. Thank you so much. Bravo, Natasha. Thank you so much for 
so clearly describing what's happening in Zambia and what you and other young women are doing. You are really leading us uh, into the future um, with your energy. Thank you so much. And now let's hear from another young woman, Shakira Namwanje, uh, who is with UNASO in Uganda, another fierce advocate who is mentoring and working with other young women to really make their voices heard on this. Shakira. Can you come off? Uh, can we see you for a minute be before you start or at least hear you? I I don't look my best right now. <laughs> no worries. We can hear you. Uh, thank you, Manju. Uh, just to speak briefly, uh, I appreciate the previous speakers and mostly for emphasizing the choice word. Uh, and here in Uganda, following the advocacy that we are doing, uh, that is our key word, choice in HIV prevention uh, for young women, for uh, women and girls. And uh, so far we have done uh, a lot of advocacy regionally through the CASPA project that we're implementing at UNASO. We have uh, engaged uh, AGYWs, uh, female sex workers in the regions and uh, educating them about the ring and how it works. And uh, this has created excitement among women and they are really excited to get to use the tool. And one of the things that really gets them excited is the fact that this tool has been used. Oh dear. Shakira is by women uh, in Uganda before, so it's not like it's it's it was it was uh, in trials outside of Uganda. But this research happened in Uganda. Hello. Yeah, Shakira, we were having a hard time hearing the last minute of whatever you said. So if you could, hopefully you are, uh, reception is better now. If you could, you could just repeat the last minute and continue. Thanks, Shakira. Uh, can you hear me now? Beautifully. Okay, so as I was mentioning, we have done advocacy in the regions, educating and empowering uh, women, AGYWs to understand how the ring works. And uh, the reason for this is uh, we believe that AGYWs have the voice to actually ask for what they want if they are empowered. And our role as, as, as UNASO is to empower them with the voices, the information around the ring. And once we, hold, we held this, uh, engagements in the different regions, Barara, Masaka, Kampala, Mukono, uh, through the AGYW forum. These young women, while in presence of their local leaders, asked to avail them with the ring, which was really, really powerful. They asked their local leaders and said, this is a tool we are interested in. And uh, we had many local leaders saying, but PrEP has been here for a while and we've seen that AGYWs are not doing very well. And hearing the young women speak for themselves and say we want to use prep some of us want to use prep some of us want to use the ring some of us want to use uh, condoms so we want a basket and we gave them the platform to be their own champions and ask this from their local leaders and uh, we want to empower them to continue pushing their local leaders until we have the ring in country another uh, key advoc uh, advocacy action that we had is once we had the information around uh, this as advocate in Uganda and as had. And the first uh, idea that we had or that we came up with was to sign a petition. And uh, we had so many people uh, cheering on or signing the petition and saying we need to push this in areas where they don't have access to 
uh, online platforms or signing the petition online, we had people signing with their hands on paper and saying, will this get to the person that we need the information to get to? Young people came to Twitter and did a Twitter storm and uh, voiced their issues around the ring. And uh, of course, through the Casper projects that we are implementing at UNASO, uh, we were holding the Women's Summit, uh, I think in July, uh, if my memory serves me right. And during this Women's Summit, women and other young advocates, young boys and men said, we need to support uh, the ring advocacy and we can take it further or up a notch. And young people took to the streets, young women marched on the streets of Kampala, voicing that they need and demand funding for the ring. We see that uh, our government says they are adopting the ring, they are adopting the ring, but we need to see further action away from just stating we are doing this and we need to see actions come out of uh, uh, the commitments that are, are being made by our government. Thank you. I hope I have summed it up. Uh, you did, Thank Shakira. you, over to you, mind you. That was fantastic, Shakira. And thank you, um, Shakira, Tasha, and Yvette. Um, we are going to take uh, one quick question, uh, follow up question around advocacy before we move on to we have brief remarks, two really important conversations or brief conversations, one from Chris at the Global Fund. And then Erica, a US researcher, is going to talk about the, the pivoting ring situation in the United States which isn't great right now. Um, so before we get there though, do we have a follow-up question or comment? We're looking for someone to raise their hand and come online or come on screen. Of course, you can always ask questions in the chat, but would anyone like to follow up with a question for Yvette, Tasha, or Shakira? And I see someone we, some of us may know, Intando Yola, is that you? Go ahead, Intando, oh, yeah. come off. Yeah, there you go. No, this is me, Jim. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, really, there's so much work that is happening around ensuring that uh, we turn the tide um, against new HIV infections. And I think my comment, really, which is something that has just hit me, and uh, especially for some of my comrades who I know, who are openly living with HIV. And I think it is really, I, mean, I don't have words to really describe it, but I think it is something outstanding and something that as the field of HIV prevention, we really have to talk about and acknowledge how women who really openly live with HIV have dedicated their time and their lives to really advocate for HIV prevention. And I think it is many things, and part of it, it is really being selfless. I think we often talk about it as advocacy for HIV prevention, but I think it is more than that. And I think this is really something that we have to take time and really acknowledge and perhaps even tell stories about why HIV prevention is really carried uh, by all of these women uh, to really make sure that the future is that of uh, that is free of new HIV infection. I just wanted to make that true. Thank you, Intando. Um, beautifully put. Uh, and I said we were going to do one question, but I'm going to break my rule. I'm going to go to Sia. Please make your your question or comment. <laughs> brief so Thank you so it. much. Go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Sia. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, oh, on my side, it's not really a question, but um, as to the effectiveness of the pyramid ring, it will just have a, a role to play in responding to, to, in, to integrated GBV incidences among the user as compared to the PrEP and other prevention intervention programming. So maybe it's high time now that we have a, an integrated strategy where the deployment ring will be of more of demand by the, 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 the beneficiaries. So we just need to, to, to organize or put into 
into place the, the modality where we see the communities are more informed of the ring and they are willingly to opt using the ring. Thank you. Thank you, Sia. Well, really well said. And I'm gonna hold questions now until the end. We will take some time after our final speakers have made their remarks. So if people wanna stick around, we will continue to take questions. And I just wanna really underscore what Sia said before we move to Chris from the Global Fund. Um, there is a role, right, for things that are not 100% effective necessarily. The best product or the best intervention for someone is the one that they're going to use. And if you are able to use and you want to use the ring, that is amazing. Uh, and that provides you way more protection than if you were using nothing. It's also something that a woman can control and has ownership of, which is really important and something that has come up. I think something the whole field has to really grapple with is this idea that the only attribute for an HIV prevention intervention is high efficacy. That that's the only thing that people care about. That's the only thing that matters. And in fact, that's not the case. There are many attributes that matter and that are important to people. And we have to listen to the folks on the ground like the folks we have just heard from. So I'm gonna get off my soapbox for a second uh, and thank everyone who has spoken so far and all the great comments. And I'm going to ask Chris to come on screen um, and share his slides. Chris, tell us a little bit about where you're from and then go ahead and make your comments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll be brief because my, my voice quality is not great. Um, so first, thank you for having me. And um, I'm the prep advisor as well as new product introduction advisor at the Global Fund. Um, and so I wanted, we've been getting a lot of questions about, especially in light of PEP fire scans about the ring, you know, does the Global Fund support implementation of the prep ring? And the answer is yes. Um, so the Global Fund is, you know, as, as a WHO recommended product, um, the Global Fund is the scans ready to support countries um, in introducing and, and implementing the prep ring, whether it's in the current grant or in the next, um, next funding application. So an important follow-up question people get is, well, how do we advocate within the country for and make our voices heard about our demand for the ring? And so <clears throat> that, you know, it's great for the Global Fund um, and those of us who sit at the Secretariat to know that, but funding applications and changes to current grants are developed through country coordinating mechanisms. Um, so that's a group of stakeholders that exists in country and involves civil society, government, and a number of stakeholders. And so I wanted to make sure that everyone here um, is aware of how to contact those CCMs. So Jim will send these slides out. Uh, Jim and Manji will send these slides out afterwards um, with the links, but there is a, um, a website where you can go um, on the global, from the Global Fund and you can select your country um, and it will tell you who the administrative focal points are for the country coordinating mechanism. Um, I would recommend that you email those people, let them know that you know you want the ring, let them know you want to be part of the conversation. Um, part of the Global Fund's um, kind of system that is set up is that those conversations around grant applications and, and funding have to be very inclusive. Um, and so your voice is going to be really important on those in those settings. So contact the administrative focal points um, for your country, let them know you want to be part of the country dialogue, ask them how you can engage, let them know that, um, you know, what you want, whether it's for the ring or anything else. Um, it's really important that um, those of us who are, you know, disproportionately affected by HIV voice our concerns um, across a number of things. So um, I will lastly put up my email address and I'll make sure it's dropped in the chat. Um, and please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and thank you so much. Thank now you. I need to be off mute. Uh, thank you, Chris, much appreciated for those uh, really important remarks. I think I can speak for everybody that I'm very um, happy to see the support from the Global Fund. Uh, and, and thank you today for, I know you're dealing with a cold and can barely talk. So um, if it's not load shedding, it's sickness, we all have to power through so many different things. Really appreciate you coming. 
Um, I'm going to turn it back over to um, my dear friend Manju to introduce our final uh, speaker for today. Thanks, Jim. And, and allow me to also thank Chris. Chris, really important uh, what you have shared with us. And, and really thank you for, for really trying to make sure that advocates know how to join the process and can have their voices heard. And talking about have their voices heard, I am very excited to um, welcome Erica Golub, who is the, a professor of health sciences with a real focus on HIV prevention for immigrants and women at Pace University. She wrote a fabulous paper about women in the US need the ring too. And we've asked her to really make sure we, we spotlight that even though we've been focusing on advocacy for African women to have access, it's really important to consider what's happening in the US. Erica. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Manju. Can everyone hear me? Yes, perfectly, Great. thank you. Okay. I, I actually don't have slides. I'm just gonna, I have a few uh, bullet points um, today. It's been so wonderful to hear about all the progress and the inspiring advocacy going on around um, the world, particularly in Africa, around the ring. And um, I just keep reflecting on how many decades we have to do this. And I feel like, I, I, you know, I've been working in women's choice issues as a scientist advocate for now in the fourth decade um, for different products. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to give just a very brief background on our publication that um, I wrote and published recently with the student, Raven Vaughn, which talks about the need for, um, the need for FDA to uh, approve the ring in the United States. And um, the main, uh, the sort of overriding concern that um, FDA's sort of uh, informal opinion that prompted then the IPM to withdraw the NDA um, uh, reflects sort of, uh, you know, a, a, there's a great concern, not just about the ring. And there's a theme that you've uh, all been uh, highlighting this uh, morning, but really does talk about and really, uh, um, you know, elevates concerns about all the products coming forward that women can control or initiate. So in our um, article uh, and the research that we did, um, you know, we document that there is, in fact, really, a, there is a need in the United States, which is, of course, not on the scale of Africa. However, there is a continuing need um, for women in the United States. Uh, um, and that where use is very low um, still among the available products, oral prep, uh, estimated about 10% in a recent CDC uh, and other uh, data. And um, a large literature that we've all been talking about on why women need more options to combat uh, and to prevent HIV infection. Um, it hasn't been easy to connect the dots from FDA's informal comments, and I really actually learned a lot from you, Leonard, uh, from something that you uh, mentioned this morning, a little bit more on their phrasing that they used in their uh, sort of discussion with uh, IPM about the, um, the sort of efficacy being lower than the standard of care. So what we actually had to do for the article was kind of connect the dots, which um, was from um, sort of the very little information and really nothing public um, uh, to speak of, uh, based on, well, um, my prior experience with the FDA going back into female condom, uh, female internal condom days, and even before in contraceptive barrier methods. So uh, the, what we did was we uh, sort of marshaled as many arguments as we, uh, as we could to support the idea that FDA um, so perspective is misguided and uninformed, and it relies heavily on a comparison of trial-based efficacy that, can, that compares the ring to the oral injectable PrEP without weighing in other significant factors, a whole host of other factors um, that concern women's ability and preferences to actually access um, the now two uh, uh, highly active uh, products that are approved in, uh, you know, in the U.S. Um, we pointed to a focus around reproductive justice um, that um, uh, Black women in the United States have 
far poorer um, access to and um, far lower rates of, a, of oral PrEP, for example, in the US than white women, vastly different rates, um, that the FDA's approach was not in keeping with HIV prevention science, which has for how many years now uh, underscored combination prevention and the, and the idea that available methods uh, should be there so that women and their partners uh, can use them and, and integrate them into the best way possible for them for the highest uh, level of protection. Um, and that the FDA, in fact, and this is sort of longstanding um, that I recognize, has conflated efficacy with the risk of a product. And I'm, I'm glad that um, many of you mentioned the safety profile of the ring because uh, it's not clear in FDA's sort of statement um, and um, and in the uh, uh, and in the WHO consultation, um, this idea that uh, it the agency remarks um, might be sowing confusion about whether the ring is actually dangerous. So we do actually make a distinction in our work uh, about efficacy and in, an inherent risk of the product, um, which is a very safe product, and especially when you put it in comparison with oral and injectable PrEP and the sorts of follow-ups that you need, clinical follow-ups and, uh, um, and, um, and baseline uh, measures. Um, we mentioned that FDA has remedies to, in fact, to address issues of patient and client understanding of complexities about partial effectiveness. There's a, there's a, a, a sort of an, uh, what's called a REMS remedy that we uh, we mentioned a bit in the article, which is things like, you know, black boxes or high, you know, certification of provider training that could be uh, done and has been done for many products, including Apertude, where um, FDA, you know, sets into motion something that um, where there's a sort of a, an assurance that that patients, clients understand things like partial effective uh, partial effectiveness. That wasn't even sort of even brought up here or mentioned as an option because things were shut down pretty quickly. And that the FDA opinion is not in keeping with other uh, global health and regulatory bodies. So um, I, you know, there's a number of other things that um, went into the, the article and the work. And, um, and there's another, you know, there's also a, my perspective as someone who's been in and around FDA decisions for a long time on these issues about women's efficacy. Um, that I didn't go into in the article, and just the idea of women be, being able to understand complexity. Um, this came up a lot in female condom, and and sort of um, know what to do <laughs> with barrier methods. So, in, none of this is particularly surprising in a way from the FDA, but it represents a really serious um, a sort of precedent for, for now and for future products. Um, and so, very briefly to conclude, uh, we call for advocates movement for US FDA approval. And um, I guess the easiest, fastest, or most direct way we saw to call for was to ask, uh, to advocate for the FDA to invite the sponsor, who's now the POP Council, of course, to resubmit the, the product and to, at the same time, demand wider stakeholder representation. So um, we can get out of the sort of the FDA advisory board bubble. Um, however, there's lots of other um, ways forward, I think, and we really need to put our heads together and um, uh, and brainstorm on those. And I'm, I'm very um, eager to to uh, to to be in, involved in that work. And thanks again for inviting me to make remarks. Thank you, Erica. Beautifully put. Thank you for all your efforts on this. It is you know, deeply upsetting that this ring is uh, not available or not accessible to women in the United States at this moment. And I really appreciate your efforts to, to change that narrative and to push back on that. So thank you, thank you. Um, we are at time, but I think there's maybe time we have, if people wanna hang out and have a few QA, little bit of discussion. Um, I see most of our speakers are still here. And I see uh, Moses has his hand up. So Moses, do you wanna, come on screen and ask your question or go verbally and ask your question? Yeah. Um, thank you so much. My name is Moses speaking from Uganda. My question goes to Chris, who has presented on behalf of the Global Fund. 
I was wondering, and I want to hear from Chris, if the status of the ring in which it is at Uganda is enough to have this included uh, in the in the application and the national application for Global Fund. Because in Uganda, the ring is just um, registered. So I wonder whether that is enough. If that is enough, then that's good news. I am part of the writing team. And so we shall include it. So waiting here from Chris. Thank you. Moses, I am sorry to say Chris had to drop off. He does have a very bad cold and he uh, went to urgent care to take care of it. So um, if you would like, if you wouldn't mind, if you could email me your question, uh, I will drop my email in the chat right now if you don't have it. And I'll make sure Chris gets it. I'll connect you to through email um, or I could just do an introduction to you to an email and then you can get your answer uh, directly, okay? Thank you, good, thank you. Thank you. And I see, I know Bridget had her hand up earlier. Um, so thank you for your patience, Bridget. Go ahead and come off mute and uh, ask your question or make your comment. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. My hand is sore. But uh, I, I want to thank all the, the presenters for starters. And um, I, I, I really want to applaud to other voice. Uh, there's, there's someone that really was saying there's a lot. I think it was in Tando. There's a lot happening. Uh, there's a lot of work that uh, uh, groups of girls and women have been doing to see that uh, uh, not just the ring, but to pronounce what this means when we're talking about choice for, for, for girls and women. And of course, uh, the networks of women living with HIV, there's a, a lot of work and I want to really, really applaud uh, every single person on this call, off this call, wherever it is that they are, that, you know, that have really put in effort and energy to push this forward. I would love, because I know we have seasoned advocates, activists of uh, women's health that are not necessarily women. We have people like you, Jim, and I've seen you uh, talk about toys, talk about the ring, people like Ntando. Uh, but I, 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 I was just thinking out of the book, how do we get uh, organized networks of, uh, of women, of, sorry, of men to talk about the ring, to talk about choice? You know, the way we have this movement and when we are talking about the ring and choice and, 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 and the movement, we see girls and women and advocates so passionate about this. I mean, it's about us, we should be passionate, but I would love to see from that side of, uh, of the continent, uh, a movement driven by men. And I think this would really um, make a very big impact when we are talking about choice from their perspective. Why is it important that, uh, you know, that your women have, uh, you know, a basket of, of, of options. Uh, I think for me, that would be something that we should be targeting. How do we uh, engage uh, our advocates, the men in our communities to stand up and speak, uh, not to speak behind us or over us, but to have their own, um, their own movement and, and, and voice about the ring and about choice. Thank you very much. Back to you, Jim. Bridget, bring it you on, Sadie, waiting to be invited to the table. Oh, I, th <laughs> uh, I think, Antenna, you accidentally came off mute. Um, Bridget, those were fantastic remarks. I could not agree with you more. This is not just uh, a one gender issue. We all need choices. Cisgender people need choices. Transgender people need choices. People who are men need choices. I want choices. Uh, I'm kind of, I have HIV, so I don't need prevention choices, but I want other choices in terms of my healthcare, right? So I think you're right. This is not just one group advocating. We all need to do this work. And I hope, you know, let's see, there's a lot of uh, what it looks like cis men in this webinar today. So if you're a cis man and you are down for, for fighting for choice for all people, can you uh, raise your hand or give a little, you know, do a little reaction? Something. We are ready. Do a thumbs up. What was that in tandem? We are ready. I'm seeing some other reactions. Uh, we, we got, we're building, we'll, we'll start building this movement right here in this Zoom room. Um, I'm going to turn it uh, back over to Manju to take the, the next question. 
Thanks, Jim. And I would say the gauntlet is to the challenges to all men all men in their diversity to really be uh, comrades in making sure choice is an option for women. But really what we want is choice of option for everyone. So they have what they need to use and that works in their life. I'm gonna take the question from Sadie, but uh, Erica, I just want to alert to you to a question that uh, Jean asked in the, in the chat as well. We'd love to get your response. So Sadie, your hand has been up and I've seen you active in the chat. Please come off mute and, and ask your question. <clears> oh, <throat> no, thank you very, thank you very much. First of all, we as a community, we love each other. So I had all the conversation and, and, and presentation about why we should not uh, provide all intervention, according as the lady say, choices. We as a community, let's say, for example, in Tanzania, we need that, uh, we need that intervention. But if we can see Uganda and other countries have it. But in Tanzania, please, if we can advocate all intervention to go at the same standard, not one can't have and other country don't have. I don't think that it can be fair for our community. Uh, all in all, we love our women and we need them to be safe. Let's fight against HIV to have all intervention equal for each and every country. Thank you, back to you. Beautiful, thank you. thank you so much. I think that is a gorgeous way for us to end with that note from you, Sadie, really calling for equity and ensuring that all countries and all people have access to the tools they need. Um, we could go on for a while having this discussion and I thank all of those people who stayed online. We're losing people fast. And thank you so much to the presenters who have all stayed here. Um, I really want to encourage each and every one of you to continue this discussion with each other and with the presenters. Um, they, most of them have shared how you can um, <clears throat> reach them, but <clears throat> we'll get their permission to share that email as well. When Jim sends all the information out, I really, um, want to thank the presenters for staying with us today and sharing their perspective and the information they have. Uh, the fight continues, the fight for access and equity continues and for choice. Um, and I really um, am in solidarity with everyone here to make sure we don't lose the momentum that has been created. So with that, I am actually going to hand over to Jim, my partner in crime and my older brother to close us out. Older and wiser. If I'm going to be older, I'm also going to be wiser. Um, I do want to take us really back quickly. This is maybe, hopefully, you can answer this briefly, Erica. But we, I did. We wanted to bring you back to Jeannie's question in the chat. And for those of you who may not see it, her her question to Erica was: If your query to the FDA moves the needle, how and when would you know? What would be the next step? So can that will be our our final answer? And then. If you all want to hang out for a little bit, we're going to put Manju's amazing Ringing the Bell playlist um, back up. So if you want to listen to a little more of specially selected music from Manju um, while you move on with the rest of your day, we'll have that playing for the next 15 minutes or so. So Erica, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, and I put a very brief answer in the chat as well. But I mean, what I didn't uh, uh, mention at the very end of my remarks was, was that um, uh, there are sort of roots. I think it's first important to say that I am not aware of, and I have not initiated any sort of um, a, a, a call to the FDA formally. And um, I think the goal is to get advocacy behind this and decide on the most effective sort of expeditious route. There are, I'm in sort of the midst of trying to understand what the um, landscape of options are. There are formal options, which are normally the most formal is called the citizen's petition, which the FDA must respond to and they have a timeline, but it does require that the product, um, in most cases that I can see so far, it does require that the product have been, um, uh, that there has been an issued a non-approval, like so a formal and frank non-approval. That's not the case in our case, you know, in this situation. Um, I think there's some exceptions um, and there are certainly other types of petitions um, to 
uh, you know, to get behind. So I think that, you know, the, but this is a discussion that needs to happen so that we can kind of back, get behind, organize and back what looks like the best one and particularly the one that will get us sort of results in the quickest, you know, um, a timeline. So, so, so that that's really all I can say right now. Um, I, you know, there hasn't been anything launched, at least to my knowledge, um, you know, uh, as a sort of a formal complaints or petition to the FDA. I hope that answers. Thank you, and I think that's uh, I appreciate that, Erica. And you know, there is some unknowns here, and I think that 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 is this is a, a watch the space moment. Um, you know, there are conversations happening uh, around this issue in the United States. And so uh, we will keep people apprised and keep everyone up to speed on that. So with that, I am, I'm messing with my controls here, but I'm gonna uh, switch back over to our opening DJ, Manju Chatani. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, we'll let this play for like the next 15 minutes or so. Enjoy, enjoy. And hopefully you can hear this, yes? Hopefa! You can hear, yes. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, am I the one, only one who can hear the music? No one believes I'm at work here in my house, guys. Uh, dancing. <laughs> I can't hear the music. <laughs> we do. He's lying, man. <laughs> you ring it right. I must bring this playlist to you know where, Manju. <laughs> and come up with a much sexier DJ name. So. All right, what's your sexy DJ name, Manju? I have to come up with it. Manju, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to uh, workshop this. DJ MCG. That's kind of hot. DJ Gada in the house. <laughs> I miss my Opa. family. I feel like I should say hello to my, my peeps, my friends. Hello. Hello, who's that? Hi, Rossi. Are you Hi. dancing, Rossi? Rossi. Hi, Lisa Rossi. Hi, Hi Lisa Rossi. Yes. Lisa Lisa yes. Rossi. <laughs> I am looking forward to seeing you, Yvette. Uh, I, I don't know, Tondo, were you invited? 